Welcome to the Beyond the Exercise podcast. I am here once again in Jersey City with my boy Joshua, and we are on another episode of the Beyond the Exercise podcast. Uh, what's going on, brother? Not much. What's going on with you? How's it's, everything? It's been very good. Uh, a lot of thinking since the last time I saw you. Cool. Uh, based on our last conversation. Awesome. Um, I really thank you again for having uh, me here at your gym, Ironbound Performance Athletics here at Jersey City. Um, I've had a lot of introspective thinking about the conversation that we had. And my goal for this podcast is to have a little bit more of a structure rather than just winging it like the last time. Despite us having a lot of good conversations and topics, Mm -hmm. um, I think this time around we're a little bit more structured, if you will. Sounds good. Like I... um... I like a more streamlined approach. I like to focus on things and hammer things down. Guys, you know, men in general are not able to multitask, so we want to just focus on one thing only. So what is the one thing you've been focusing on lately? Uh, well, lately for me, like personally. Mm-hmm. Um, mainly is finding other revenues of other, other revenues, other lanes of revenue for myself that I had to contemplate on that is different than... Uh, the training aspect. Mm-hmm. So obviously, personal trainers, coaches, fitness instructors. Um, there is a good percentage of us that has our stream of revenue just come from that one thing, and that is training, and that is training either one on one in a group. And um, I wanted to sort of expand more on that and figure out ways that we can possibly. Be more financially adept to our to our society to pay the bills. You know what I mean to uh, put food on the table. Yeah. And what is the if you could choose one thing that pops up into your mind right now, what would that be? Uh, there's nothing that's like really out there that's striking me right now. I do feel that um, when you focus on a one on one, you focus on that one client. Now, whether you sell $100 a session or you sell $1,000 a session, you are limited for that one hour and that one time, and that's time you cannot get back. Um, So what I'm sort of thinking is like, hey, there's an online approach, and there are people who are really great at it, who are doing well on the online world, but a lot of what they're doing is not so different than what we're doing in, in person. It's that the only difference is... You get to eliminate getting there, transportation, taking the time to get there, gas money, path ride, you know, coming right back. And that takes a bit of a toll. It all takes it takes more time and it requires you some money or gas to get there. Right. Um, so what I'm sort of thinking about, and this is sort of like the... Um, uh, there's a guy in the jiu-jitsu world who was like the first millionaire for, bleh, first millionaire to sell DVDs of like jiu-jitsu stuff. Obviously, he had to make a name because his uh, athletes were like winning gold medals, world championships. And then he became known as like, oh, he's the guru. He's the, he's the main guy. And that recognition allowed him to like sell DVDs. And now people bought those DVDs. And um, worldwide, instead of like focusing on this one area. So if he's in Midtown Manhattan, your clients are only in Midtown Manhattan, which is there's a lot of people, but it's only focused on one area. Whereas what if you have a broader outreach and you can train somebody that you never have to meet on the other side of the world? And so that's sort of like something that I'm sort of contemplating. What's, you know, is it sort of like how the how the beef is made sort mm-hmm. of like thing that I'm thinking about. So a couple of things that I was thinking about while you were talking about that part of how you're trying to expand and how you're trying to find different re- uh, streams of revenue. I was always coming back to the thought of where as personal trainers, let's just talk personal trainers right now. And we are specifically talking to other trainers right now, specifically talking to ourselves actually as well, is that where do you think is the bridge between having an online business that's through the masses and having an online business that's one-on-one but still trying to 
multiply your time by not spending one hour strictly on one person, but multiple people at the time. And where the skill sets divide, right? Mm -hmm. So the way that I'm thinking about it before you answer here is, is as you can build a library, right? Exercise library. You yes. get a lot of clients. You plug in things. You say do it. Conversely, you have other people who need more of your service rather than just like, sure, you can plug these in, but I also need the support from you where you do check-ins, you do follow-ups, you actually teach me on how to do these exercises. Mm -hmm. So purely based on a skill set standpoint mm -hmm. of a personal trainer like you, where do you think bridges the gap from being a more hands-on personal trainer online versus being more of a hands-off personal trainer online? Right. Um, so I have to clearly define what is personal training and what I'm sort of like further down the road, if this becomes a thing and you sell programs or whatever, you don't really get the same one-on-one -on -one attention. You don't get that moral support. You don't get that like I per se, you know? Um, and that's the thing. That's why personal training one-on-one -on -one should be the highest, should be your most expensive service. And like you're not going to get that from sort of online. You're going to like the medium. If you go on zoom, the medium of the screen is sort of like a little bit of a barrier. So you sort of have to navigate and which we all did during the pandemic. We all had to become zoom trainers and I unwillingly had to make myself that I hated every minute of it. So I was like, I don't like this. I like the personal feel. I like the personal vibe. I like to have a good session. I like to see where the person's at emotionally and I can, give a good assessment but i feel like there's sh the the gap that i would be trying to bridge would be trying to figure out a way that's going to be giving you a template that you are okay with and that's just good enough if you that, that's why we have standards you know military has standards in schools we have standards so in training if you're going to give somebody a template you should give somebody a template that's going to you're going to present it like tutorials and videos but also like hey these are also the standards that i'm looking for this is the angles of where your shoulders should be uh this is where your hips should not sag uh this is the standard we're looking for and you have to at home make your best assessment am i doing this correctly let me have an honest conversation with with myself and then um, that's, that's what I want to present. I don't want to have a cookie cutter program. It's like, Hey, you know, 30 jumping jacks and, you know, burpees and whatever and all that stuff. And that's a great workout. Sure. And that's what like a lot of trainers like to give out. Cause it's kind of easy. It's sort of like I wrote it down on a piece of paper I'll and you just it. follow along. And like, there's no at special attention to detail when it comes to, looking for indicators of your movement and that's where the skill of the trainer like if this were to be myself or someone else that's listening um that's where it sort of differentiates how much time are you paying attention to that detail right i think another thought that i have with that question is when you have somebody online who says that they're a personal trainer and let's say they're writing out a program for you now the skill set of a personal trainer actually a good personal trainer is actually finding ways and how to appropriately communicate to somebody and how to properly use a program, mm -hmm. right? I think we all know that ChatGPT is around now and AI is the future. And if you really wanted a workout program, I'm probably shooting myself in the foot here, mm -hmm. but you could literally ask ChatGPT for a workout. You could. You can have every single detail in there and it will give you a tailored workout. But can somebody call themselves a personal trainer if... Let's say you're a client. I'm mm -hmm. a personal trainer online. You ask me for a program. I ask ChatGPT for a program. Mm -hmm. I extract that or I just make up a random program for myself mm -hmm. and I give it to you. Does that qualify me as a personal trainer? No, um, you, it, 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 it does not. Um, there's a lot of nuances that go with personal training and those that have been in the field for a long time um, knows what that is. And I, I wouldn't be able to clearly define it. I could point out some things that are really different. A lot of it is just, yes, it's the coaching, it's the cueing, it's the knowing of a person, what their strengths and weaknesses are. What is it like, I would say like, yeah, everyone has 
movement assessments, but the assessment of a client is every single day. Like you ask questions, how much sleep did you get? What's going on? You're a little off today. That's something AI won't tell you. That's something a machine will not tell you. The machine says, oh, you have to do this. But the personal trainer knows that something's off. We're either going to shorten the rest, uh, uh, make the rest longer, shorten the reps, make the weight a little lighter. And that's like uh, on the spot judgment call on the trainer. And that's where I would, that's where I feel confident in is that I know who I'm training. I know what they are. I know them better than themselves. And I'm going to make a decision for you. I'm, I'm not, I think AI is a devil. I think um, anything that was good that was ever created was already made already. I think I said that last time. Um, but I, I'm not, at, at no point am I worried about AI or any of that automation or whatever. If somebody wants to pay a few bucks to, to do AI, it, it sort of weeds out the people who are actually looking for progress. Right. You know, if you really want to take it to the next level, if you look at the Olympics, everybody that walks up uh, in that parade of nations, everyone has a coach. Nobody has a chat GPT, personal trainer, strength coach, strength and conditioning specialist. They don't have anyone that's a machine. Everyone has a coach. I'm actually very eager to see in maybe five, 10 years when this becomes a lot more advanced, if mm -hmm. that would be the case. That would be so cool where somebody's coming out. But I also think that the human aspect of it, as like you said, of really learning and understanding the person in front of you and doing it over and over and over and really know when you can push somebody mm -hmm. that will not break them and learning on how to step on the uh, the gas pedal or not the gas pedal, the brake pedal for someone mm -hmm. when they don't know how to themselves. Correct. So this is like a really good question that I have for you that I think is very simple, but what is one thing that you think you need to develop on to be an even better trainer? Uh, as of right now, in, 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 in any aspect. Any aspect that makes you do your job as a personal trainer better and provide a better service to anybody who you're training. A lot of it that I sort of had to learn in this process right now, and, that's, and, and they don't tell you this early on. When you get your personal trainer certification, when as you do your onboarding, um, it's it's really just understanding people, um, having empathy, the psychology of different minds. I train with athletes, I train with moms, I train with seniors, and everybody I have to train differently. And it's sort of like navigate that. I can't, you know, just be like this person that's like, I wrote it like this, so you have to do it like that. And I have to coach it like this, and he's, these are the cues. You know, retract your shoulder blades, pull yourself down, bring yourself like uh, up, extend your elbows, uh, push the floor down with your feet, uh, brace the core, all that stuff. Yes, you use those are cues, but um, understanding people's motivations, um, talking with a lot of people, getting exposed to different groups, ethnicities, different backgrounds, social, socioeconomic backgrounds is a, is a must needed thing for trainers to do. And that's something I'm trying to improve on, um, coming from a gym, which was a little affluent, um, moving into Jersey city where it's a broad mix of people, which is great. You get to learn what really gets their gears grinding. You know, and you understand what people, what, what triggers people, what ticks people off, what motivates people. That's like the thing that people really need to understand to get it to the next level in order, because, you know, there's, there's ways of coaching and you can't be the same for every single person. Two things that I want to take away from what you just said, the personal motivations of people and how you can encourage them and how to train harder and or be healthier or get whatever they want out of the personal training service. Mm -hmm. And two, uniquely training people in Jersey City or in any big city to begin with. Mm -hmm. I just went to a seminar in at Reload uh, PT in Union Square in New York City and Manhattan. And we talked about work-life balance, stress, of people who are living in New York City. And I think it was a very interesting topic because you're coming at a perspective of training people who are, one, probably 
are working their ass off from trying to survive and live inside one of the hardest cities. Mm -hmm. And then two, just stress all, stress all over, right? And you talk about this like stress bucket. You have poor sleep, you have poor nutrition, you have stress management, and then now you're putting even more stress on yourself, which is the exercise or the workload, mm -hmm. right? So I want to take a step back with what you're talking about, the motivations and the personal motivations of people. I've been finding that as I'm training my clients and I'm always trying to take a step back and trying to put forward in front of them or trying to trying to create this image in front of them, take the back, not even creating an image. Mm -hmm. I'm actually pulling an image from what we used to talk about, mm -hmm. about what their motivations are. Do you find that at any time when you're training somebody one-on-one -on -one, that the more times that you're trying to pull that old image in front of them, which is what they told you that they wanted, can get monotonous, can get, in a way, demotivating? And how do you, as a personal trainer, maneuver in a better way where you can actually motivate them in a positive way rather than keep on telling and showing them something that they're not achieving? Right. Um, yeah, so let me un unpack that. It's it, There's different broad ranges of people. Now... You and I, we have clients that are just a gift. Uh, I call them, um, if you know the Anchorman analogy, it's sort of like, um, what's the guy's name? Uh, the Anchorman, I forgot his name. Anyways, well, there are clients that are, that are sort of like that, that will do anything you say, and I, I call them good soldiers. Uh, so you write whatever's on the teleprompter, and he has to read exactly what that is. Those are gifts. And everybody's like, oh, I love training those people. And those are the guys you have to press on the gas pedal. Uh, oh, the and, gas and pedal yes. For. Yeah. And, and right. for me, that's like no problem. I was like, I, okay. Like you, you say whatever I want. Cool. We're going to move this at this weight. And we're going to go here at that speed and this distance. And then there's other people that, and, and personal trainers will get this because a lot of people who need a lot of attention are those that are going to inquire personal training. Now, those are the hours that are sort of like, I'm going to be real and it's, and, and I'm going to let people know what's behind the curtain. Those hours are, are very brutal. And it's very like we're looking at the clock and we're just trying to see why is time going slower? Because there's some people that you, for lack of better words, it's like bringing a horse to water. It's like these are the people that cancel on you. And these people who are just like, oh, can we do something else? And you got to sort of have to be an entertainer and you got to have to be like, you know, find a new thing that's going to get them to be motivated. And that's annoying because you, the only way you can bench press 315 is if you keep bench pressing every single week, at least twice a week. And you're going to do that for a certain amount of years. And, you, and it's repetitive and it is monotonous, but it's your goal. And that's the only way to get to your goals. You don't do it from randomness. Um, but you and I get that. But there are certain people that are just like, oof, um, you, you sort of have to, that's why the personal training is very niche and undervalued, I think, because we have to hear the ins and outs of what's going on in their lives and try to figure out, hey, geez, you're very stressed out here. How can I maneuver this so you could sort of be excited to do the workout? How I can get you to like, Take less rest period. I know you're talking to me. I know you're like trying to get more rest out of it by trying to strike up a conversation. I know what you're doing. You're not the first. You won't be the last. But like pick up that weight. Like, all right, it's been seven minutes already, you know. So um, I, th I think I was like going off tangent. Um, no, that was you're right on yeah. point. I, I think I, I, I understand where you're coming from, where I think it's much of a chess game playing with people right and it's a it's a long chess game where it goes on for days for months even years and i think majority of the time is for me i think i talked about this the last time was about providing space for people mm -hmm. and i think sometimes that space can sometimes can be taken advantage of either from a client or either from me as a personal trainer mm -hmm. like i've always caught myself m a lot of times where i'm just talking and talking and talking and there's no lifting that's going on yeah now i understand that sometimes the conversation at hand is actually helpful because it's helping them to understand why they're doing xyz or mm -hmm. it may help them to get xyz yeah. but i think also as from a personal trainer standpoint that we have to be accountable to make sure that we are actually still getting the job done. 
But also from a client perspective, I believe that you also have to make sure that you are the one being accountable or taking accountability for the time that you're there. I had a client before I said that he saw he, he his friend mentioned to him that in his personal training experience, mm-hmm. majority of the time that the personal trainer would just talk. Mm-hmm. Talk, yeah. talk, talk. We all talk, have those. Talk. If you've been in the game long enough, you will find those. Yes. And I think as a client, if you do have a personal trainer who's constantly talking, I think there's multiple ways you can approach this, but these are two that I can think about right now. Mm-hmm. It's either you just, you keep on listening to what they're saying, but you just keep on moving. Do the exercise, let them blab away. Mm-hmm. Or two, you tell them, we're going to come back to that thought and let me lift this real quick. Yeah. So I think I, I, yes. Yeah. So I think I'd, from both ends, I think there has to be some kind of respect and accountability because you can't purely put it on one person or the opposite side for the job not being done. Yes, and I could find I could see how that's very hard too because you're trying to instill a little accountability that they take on themselves, and it's very hard because what a lot of clients I'm assuming are they going to see this as a service thing? I pay you this, therefore you get me that. Hundred per and and it's sort of like okay, well I I'm only in charge for like three hours out of seven days of the week, and whatever you do outside of this hour, those hours has a more direct effect on your performance or whatever your goals are. And now I have to have you buy into that. I have to, you have to admit to accountability. And that's one of the hardest things that we have to instill on people. I would love if we could audit people's lifestyle like the IRS does, you know? And I'd be like, oh my God, I ate so healthy. And I'm supposed to take your word for it. But part of me was, doesn't believe you, you know? Um, it's like you're hiding, you're hiding yeah. the important details. Where were you this weekend? You know, why are you having four hours of sleep? You don't have a child. Where did you go? You know, I, I don't want to be like, I don't want to be that nagging partner, you know, <laughs> but it's sort of like, there's got to be a trust factor, but further down the road, you got to have this talk of accountability. And that's the main thing. If they can buy into that, you're, you're, you're set, you're, 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 you're you're close to getting the ultimate goal. Right. You know? I think there's like different approaches to, or different images of what different kinds of buy-ins from different people come from, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like talking about what you just said, that you don't have a kid. Some people do have kids, mm-hmm. right? Like, why are you getting four hours of sleep? Some people are like, that's all I can get. So where do you think in terms of the majority of the clients that you have or other people have that are not getting the goal that they want, which is either losing the weight that they want or gaining the weight they want. And we're not talking about nutrition, mm-hmm. but lifestyle choices. Right. Um, what are the biggest ones that come to mind? It is a little bit of self-actualization, a little bit of introspection, and just be honest with who you are. And sort of like if you, you're paying a personal trainer and we're sort of underqualified, we're underpaid, because you want to get to a goal and there's a lot that's required to, for you to get that goal. Um, but a lot of it is sort of like this admittance that you're not doing things correctly. Like I don't have the habits to get me to where I want them. I thought I could pay this personal trainer and I could get to that goal. But I sort of have to look within. It's like I'm the problem. I have to get them to admit that without saying it. You know, but that's probably, that's true. Like, why are you not getting to your goals? Like, I say that as a disappointed Asian parent, you know, Um, like, why don't you have an A plus? What is this B, you know? But that's, that's, that's just the main thing is have an honest conversation with yourself, inform um, your, your personal trainer, your coach, what the main issue is, what you have a hard time with. Try to be vulnerable. Try to see a therapist. Try to figure out what is, I, maybe I got a mental block. Maybe there's something deep down. There's some scars inside from the past that I can't get rid of. That's like, you know, that's why some people like to eat, like to snack, you know. They don't know it, 
Like, that's the thing about snacking. You don't know how much calories we're eating because we're subconsciously eating. Um, so just taking a minute to just look deep within themselves. Right. Yeah, I, I totally resonate with that because even with my own training over the... I've been training for maybe 12, 13 years now myself. Mm -hmm. I've only been a trainer for maybe eight years now. But I can definitely see the development of my training from the first time I started to now because back then I think I was like fueled from rage, fueled from the feeling of lack. And I think that's why, one, I was just lifting too much. Mm -hmm. And granted, I was getting a lot of progress, but then I wasn't really learning the skill of balance because my whole life was being surrounded by just weights. I would eat a certain way just so I can get stronger, but then that's also with the trade-off of losing the other things that are important with life, whether that was relationships with others, relationship with myself, and just general balance of how the whole world works that's mm -hmm. not surrounded of kettlebells, dumbbells, barbells, like mm -hmm. all this weight stuff. And it, not until when I went to therapy myself was I truly understood that I was fueled before by the wrong reasons. And as I grew up, maybe it's from maturity as well as you grow older, but I think truly it's because from, uh, from therapy was that I wasn't fueled by the wrong things anymore. And right. now I train more for health. Right. I don't train for like the six pack and for the vanity for what other people may think about me anymore. So I think with, to top off what you were saying was I think there comes to the point where people have to bridge over to the point where you are training for the right reasons. And yes, being totally honest with yourself, what you are able to give and you're actually being honest from, from for what you're actually giving to make sense of what you're actually getting. Right. And, and I applaud you and thank you for sharing. Like you had a moment where you realized this and you, you went to therapy. I think therapy is very healthy. I think a lot, I think everybody should do it. And, yeah. and then you had this actualization and sort of maybe somebody had to like, um, put the pieces together, together, you know, and be like, figure out why is it what this is, and then sort of like a moment for you to realize, you know what? Yeah, I was like this. I I understand it now, and now I can sort of maneuver my way to sort of like train for the right reasons now. Like I know what I was, know what it is. It feels so freeing to just admit that out loud, admit it to other people, and sort of like, hey, okay. Now let's get to work for the real reasons and, 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 and be free. You know what I mean? And sort of like, oh, my God, my training is so much better now. I'm not this angry if that's, if that's a case or that's an issue. You, you know, you're not that person that you once were. And that, that's, that's growth. And I think that we all need to go through this, clients and trainers, you know. So do you think with the structure of group classes, so let's say somebody comes in here at Ironbound Performance Athletics and they take classes. Mm -hmm. And sure, I truly understand that you guys have a structure with your group training. Mm -hmm. But let's say somebody who's coming once a week, once every other week, now you fall off from the whole structure. And now do you think that just truly being honest with yourself, like I'm not being consistent enough that I won't see all these different type of results that I'm supposed to be receiving, mm -hmm. but being aware for yourself that you're not actually putting in the work that you need to put into in order to get the results. Do you think that if a lot of people were to be more aware about that, that a lot of the issues of people having no idea why things aren't working would be better? 100%. I, I, I really think that. And obviously in a group session, you have very little control. You just do the workouts and everybody has a good time, put some music on that people like. Um, but you won't get the same effect that you would get a one-on-one -on -one because you're tethered to the person. You, you know, you you do have a little bit of control. You do have like, hey, give me some feedback on what's going on in your life. In a group class, um, it's kind of different. Um, the The best thing that you can do in a group class, and I say this because we're mainly a group class gym even though we do have private training um we we don't hold anybody accountable and group classes don't i'm just gonna say it is what it is yoga pilates any dance class any spin class we're just giving you a workout we're not really giving you a map of 
where you should be. It's sort of like fit this however you can to get whatever your goal you're trying to get. And the only thing we can do as group fitness or group instruction is to just make it a safe space that they feel okay to be themselves and whatever it is, because I can't, um, I can't project what ideal fitness should be, what ideal strength should be, what an ideal physique should be, because everyone's going to come in with different definitions. And as a group class, you have to be welcoming and okay with that. Um, and if they come in with complaints, yee, well, sorry. Uh, private training is this much. It's probably five times more. So is what it is. You know what I mean? I think anybody who's, who is listening to this podcast and just listened to that segment that you went over to rewind mm -hmm. and go back to the beginning of this question of, of, of your answer, because I think with a lot of people, if you're more aware about the results that you're going to get from these group classes, like you said, yoga, Pilates, or just generally group classes, there is structure to your workout, but there's no structure to your whole program, to the whole longevity of mm -hmm. your training. So the way that I'm understanding of what you just said, as long as people can understand that in group training, if you're coming in for a workout to get a sweat on, to get some gains, but more than likely is not going to actually get you the large result or the actual the defined result that somebody's looking for. As long as you have an understanding of that, mm -hmm. we should be okay. We should be okay. We should just have an honest conversation and just say we can't be, we can't save everyone. And we have to be okay with that. And the saving usually comes from the one-on-one. -on -one. It, it, it's going to be to easier, extent, yes, yes. easier it, to save. Easier because you have more degrees of control. Um, but in group classes, there's variability from person to person, hour to hour. You're going to get so many different characters. And we, we, we can't save everyone. We just... We hope you like it and we hope you like us and co please come back, you know, cause we're a business and we need to put food on our table. Right. That's a, that's, that's the best we could do. And that was sort of like the evolution of my training coming from a personal trainer background. I wanted to create the most effective training possible mobility, strength, and a high intensity cardio towards the end. Um, everything is compound lifts, everything is full body, and that's the best way to get results. And then now, like my metamorphosis of what my view on group classes are is just, hey, make them like you uh, and have events so people will like sort of network with each other and have a community and, and, and have a place that they feel safe and they like to be and get away from their job or get away from their spouse. Uh, if that's the case, but whatever it is, it's like, it's a little bit of escape. It's a little bit of an escape. It's no different than movies or books. Um, we are an escape from whatever that is. And that's, that's a great thing. If they found that in you. As I'm listening to everything that you're saying, I'm seeing that you're explaining a lot of this surface stuff, like being real, being like, this is actually what it is. But the way that I'm looking at this now is like trying to like peek behind the curtains. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're really doing here is that you're providing this space, this welcoming space and allowing people to come in, not, not to be scared of the weight, scared of other people and actually just get up and get moving. And I think what's really helpful with what you're cultivating here in Jersey City is, again, you're sparking interest for people to come to a place to actually do something rather than nothing. And I believe, and, and the way that I'm even assessing your Instagram account and what I see about the things that you're posting, the type of community, like you have normal people who are coming in here who are competing. Like that's crazy because now the way that I'm seeing it, it's so impactful for somebody to just think like, oh, I want to compete. But then now they don't think they can compete because they're just normal people and they don't have the environment. And you're in like a big box gym where like mm -hmm. everybody's on their headphones. Nobody's encouraging. Nobody's really looking at your form or everybody's looking at you, but nobody's there to help you. Mm -hmm. And the, the way that I'm seeing it is like, I love how you're explaining all this surface stuff. But when I'm like looking beyond all of those exercises, mm -hmm. I'm like seeing this core that you're really cultivating and allowing people to really, you know, break through. Mm -hmm. And actually make an impact for themselves, and that's what I really love about your the the pers uh, the group training stuff. Which, honestly, I personally I like the one on one route because I like to get to know people to like a deeper level, mm -hmm. um, and to I like just putting more attention into the 
one person in front of me rather than the whole group setting. Yeah. But I can definitely see how, especially you are running the group personal training classes here rather than other places. Right. Um, thank you. Yeah, really, that was a statement. So no, yeah, that no. was a statement. No, no I really appreciate that. I, 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 I tell people to like, hey, to go back on the point on like, hey, you have people competing for stuff. I'm throwing it out there. And I was like, hey, I think this is kind of cool. And um, there's a little bit of character growth. There's a hero's journey in every single person that does sign up for it. And the weights doesn't doesn't even matter, to be mm -hmm. honest. You sign up for a high rocks, which one of our uh, coaches did finish in. Um, you sign up for a jujitsu tournament or you want to do powerlifting, which is coming up next month for us. Um, there's like a lot of training and the, and the training is a little bit more intense than my group classes because it's more focused now. And it's sort of like, oh my God, this takes a lot of work and, and, and this is brutal. And, but what's happening is that the process, the 12 week that people had to follow in my powerlifting program is there's a lot of like, it's an eye opening moment that people get to, um, fix uh you know to to like look upon and it's sort of like oh my body is capable more than i ever knew and there's something liberating about that when your body can push through things that i didn't know i, I didn't know i can squat 300 i didn't know that i could bench press 225 and i did or i didn't know that when my name is called to perform on stage that I actually did really well. I had people compete in the last competition, last powerlifting meet in the winter. And some people were like, oh my God, I was so nervous. I was freaking out. I wanted to back out. But once it was all done, I was like, when's the next one? I want to try this. It's so, this was such a fun experience. Training is hell. Everyone hates me. Everyone curses me out because the training sucks. But the end goal is sort of like, wow, I'm happy for what it, what it made me. I'm like, it made me push through. And there's a lot of things that you could sort of benefit through out in life from physical training. Perseverance for one. Perseverance, um, grinding it out. And it, it's a metaphor for what, how we handle things in life. But it actually just, I don't know, it just makes you a better human. It makes you more resilient, you know? Yeah. And that's, again, like a, going back to what I said, you're, you're providing, you're opening you're presenting a door for mm. people to walk through. Mm -hmm. Now, it's really up to them whether or not they want to put their hand on that knob and go through that door. Yeah. But the the wonderful thing, again, that you're doing here is you're literally presenting a door to people. And I, I just, I find that so, I don't even know what word to use, but I just, I, I highly commend that. And it's it's just the way that I even see videos online of people powerlifting. Like, a lot of people love seeing, like, thor like deadlift like a thousand mm -hmm. hundred pounds and like because you know it's it's like the it's like the test of human strength right? right but now that i'm seeing it on a broader scale like i'm looking at somebody who's i don't know 45 years old and they're like their third attempt on their max deadlift is like 165 pounds mm -hmm. like back then i used to look at him like bro what are you doing like that's 165 pounds but to them it's 165 pounds. It's their Super Bowl. It's their Olympics. It's sort of like, this is the most important thing to me in this very moment. And we should not downplay that. Never. We should like... Not um, anymore, like, at least. Like, you you love that. We have guys that compete in a local jiu-jitsu tournament and just sort of like, that's their thing. And we got to like, hey, support them. That's their Super Bowl. Like, you know, not all of us. There's a certain percentage of the world that can go to the Super Bowl, can go to the Final Four. Um, and that's fine. They're athletic, genetic outliers. But for us, this is our coliseum. Like, oh, this was, that was great. I had so many eyes watching me and that was a lot of fun. It was exhilarating. And you get to tell that story on your deathbed. Nobody wants to talk about, oh, you know, these deadlines that I, that I made, you know, that time that I showed up, uh, I had a perfect attendance and you know, I, I made that presentation for my boss. I'm like, no one talks about that stuff. But you're going to share. Yeah, I did powerlifting. It was a lot of fun. I deadlifted 315. I thought it was like a, a woman that deadlifts 315 or people that get their first pull-up. Those are the stories that they will share. Those are the stories that they will sort of like 
help influence other people, influence their uh, kids to like be just more physically active. Yeah. I think that's I think that's more powerful than any Thor deadlift, even though he's great. Yeah, you know that that's what gets me. You know, loving my job too when I'm training my one on one clients and you know they're pushing past their limited capabilities that they thought were the ceiling and they push past that ceiling. Like I really love when my client gets that first pull up mm -hmm. and she like turns around and she's like, holy fuck, like I got a pull up. Yeah. And it's crazy. And, and also like some people who are just like, I've never thought I could do this and now I can. Yeah. That's the one thing that fills my heart the most. Like for some people, like sure, we can lose 20 pounds. You look good in the mirror. But what really warms my heart throughout that journey and throughout that process is not actually you use losing the 20 pounds. It's like the things that you had to endure while getting to losing 20 pounds. Like that's so much more fruitful to me. For sure. I 100% I agree. I think that's powerful, more powerful than any, you know, like I lost 10 pounds in 28 days and, you know, um, but cool. yeah, great. It's great, you know, but. How do you feel? Like, you know, like, are you the same asshole that you were 30 days ago? You know, um, no, you know, so. So kind of to segue on the training aspect for clients. And I've always wanted to understand what the whole concept of. So there's one question that I've been having a little hard time of answering lately. And I do understand that you have to answer this question a little differently from person to person. But it's the question of. I want to build muscle. I want to be toned, but I don't want to get too bulky. Right. I just want to know from your perspective how you answer this question. Because for me, I always have different angles on how to answer this question. Right. But I'm very highly interested to see how you answer this. So this thing with um, the bulky question, right? Um, it's a tale as old as time. It's a question you get day number one. Um, someone's going to start out with it. And um, I think it was more prevalent back then. They said you started for like eight years, a little more than that. Mm -hmm. um, so I probably started around the same time. Um, eight, nine, ten years, whatever it was. Um, I think that question is less prevalent. And so more people are going into the gym culture. And it's like a lot of women that you see nowadays are more welcoming to the idea of doing weight trainings, which is a great sign. But yes, you still do get that question. And how I would prepare it is sort of like how you prepare an email template of, hey, somebody sent you this for work. It's like, cool, I have a e prepared email template. Instead of having an emotional connection to it, which I did. Because when somebody asked me that, I would have an emotional connection and I would just take a deep breath, roll my eyes a little bit, and I just, I, I got to realize that's not the best approach. That's not the best approach. Be a, So I had to find myself, be a little bit more stoic, be a little bit more understanding. And this is my job. This was a teaching moment. Okay. It's my role as an educator to tell them what we all know. You know, there's no way you can, <laughs> there's, you, there's no way you can get bulky. I wish I could get bulky. I wish I could gain muscle. You know what I mean? And it's a little, it's very hard for me. So for you to get that, also, that's not the right approach, too. It's just like, oh, it's very hard to do that. What you're going to get is a more automated response uh, where you're like, hey, affirm what they say. You know, I understand how you can uh, feel that way. Uh, just letting you know that men... Uh, the reason why men are able to become bulky is because of like testosterone levels and women have, I don't know what it is, one eighth, one tenth, science always changes. Uh, like testosterone, so it would be very hard for women to uh, have, uh, to, to gain muscle that quickly. So what you do would be very similar to what men do, but you're going to get a more, and I hate to use this word, but you got to use it because that's how, that's what their language is. What's going to happen is that your muscles are going to actually tone, all right? Now, I hate using that word, but you sort of got to meet people at their level and you got to speak their language because you can't speak your language to them because you might as well be speaking Portuguese. You know, they don't know what you're saying. All the science, cool, I'm throwing it in your face. 
they're not ready for that yet. You got to meet them where they are. You got to use words like tone. Um, you got to use wor words like fat loss, core, you know, stuff like that. Stuff that they find like a little trendy. Uh, you know, you don't have to like sell your soul, but you got to find a template and you got to find what works for you. So you have an automated response, but whatever you do, don't just be a little understanding, be a little empathetic and be willing to educate. Don't downplay, don't make him feel stupid, any of that stuff. Can I tell you how I approach this Go question? Ahead. I would love to hear it. I love to hear everyone's answer. So the way I approach it now is, you know, I am empathetic, I listen, do more of a stoic type of approach to it where mm -hmm. I'm calm, relaxed. I don't have to do the deep breaths anymore. I don't have to lay down some knowledge on somebody anymore. But what I do simply do now is hear them out let them finish their story. And then what I say is, sure, no problem. Let's lift some weights. Let's see where you go. Let's lift as much as you can or whatever you're willing to give me. And then every day, just look in the mirror. And then the day that you say that you're too bulky, that's when we'll just put, just step on the brake pedal. That's a great approach. Yeah. Sometimes you could just say, sure, no problem. And then, cool, hinge, squat, push, pull. You know right. what I mean? Like, you could just do that. Hinge, squash, put, pull. Uh, oh, well, I just want to tone. Oh, yeah, no problem. Hinge, squat, push, pull, do some carries. Right. Um, I think it does get lost in translation, like you said, because, you know, there's some people who do want to, you know, they want to, let's just use a woman as an example. Like, they want to build bigger glutes. But they do know that your glutes are actually getting bulkier. That's the reason why it's getting yeah. a lot bigger. Don't say the B word in yeah. front of them. Oh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no. Your glutes are just going to, yeah, they're going to tone. Tone. They're going to like, yeah, we're going to help improve the way the glutes are shaped. Shaped is another word that they like to use. Mm. So you got to speak their language. Right. Uh, but I mean, the way you did it, I I, I, well, I would like to steal it from you. Right. You know, like, I mean, that even goes for like men or women. Like some men just don't like to be bulky per se, but they want to be like super cut and ripped. Yeah. But you kind of have to be bulky first to build that muscle in order to cut down to be shredded to look cut. You and I understand. That. <laughs> but yes. we can't explain it to that people no. because they're just like, you're like the teacher from Charlie Brown. They're, they're not going to get that. Um, so there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I'm only a push-ups, pull-ups kind of guy. I'm a calisthenics guy. And I'm like, just shut up. If you're afraid to get strong, just say that. Um, but you, you got to word it in a way that's sort of like, yeah, yeah, no problem. No, no, no. I, I, I totally get where you're coming from and we'll make sure we're, we'll, we'll, we'll make you get there. Right. And yeah. I think people who are listening to, to this episode, it's not much of a manipulative approach where we're just downplaying what you're saying and we're just pushing it aside. I think it's much of, well, at least from my perspective and your perspective, is that we understand what you're saying. And for us to add on any more comments or, or comments to what you just said doesn't really help the whole purpose of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes like what they say is the best thing to say is nothing at all. And I think in this particular situation as well, it's, it's sometimes just let it, let it be. I think everybody from a personal trainer's perspective knows what we really need to say, but also the person who's actually in front of that client knows when to say it or actually what to say as well. Use fewer words, you know, absolutely. Like not say nothing. I think like silence, like what you said is a really good thing to do. Like silence is, is actually a good way to answer, but also just use a few words mm -hmm. and then you just go on the other level. Like no one wants to know it. No one likes to hear a know it all. No one wants to hear too many sciencey type words. Um, you just want to, again, meet them where they're at. They didn't take a NASM. They don't have a CSCS. They didn't go for uh, kinesiology. They don't understand that. So you just want to know what probably some stuff that they heard before. And we're going to just use that to like discuss with them. Too. Bro, that was, this was, this was a lot better podcast and also i think a lot more structure like how we intended to in the beginning mm -hmm. i really love the points and the topics that we we tackled and uh again like i said before i can talk to you all day about anything and everything and uh i really appreciate your time again today bro yeah man it was a good time yeah i no. really like your perspective and your angles towards um personal training and i've yet to actually have a sit down conversation on this podcast with somebody who is like outra outrageously thinks differently of me, which I will never not entertain because I would definitely like to see other perspectives. But mm -hmm. one thing that I love 
talking with you is we do have the both both the same perspective and angles towards the conversations that we've had so far. So I think I'm a little biased. That's the reason why I like talking to you. But um, aside from that, I think this was a really good one. Yeah, absolutely. It's good to share his perspective. We might have we might look at things the same way, but we have different ways of expressing it, and I think that's fine. I think we sort of like you know yeah we sort of align in a lot of things that we that we uh, view things, especially in our field. So that's a good thing. Yeah. We need some we need contrarians is what we need. People yeah. who are just gonna steer the pot and it's just like the extreme right. far other side. You know what I mean? I know a handful of them and uh it's very interesting to see how, you know, everybody's everybody's opinion is not valid, but everybody has an opinion. Yeah. So they're like assholes. Yeah. Everybody has one. One <laughs> So to end off this podcast, uh, take a little different approach from the last time I ended it off, but uh, kind of the same concept, I guess. But all in all, what do you think is one topic of conversation that more people need to have that's beyond the exercise? Uh, like it's something related we, we, we did fitness. today. Fitness-wise. Fitness, fitness um, betterment, progress. I would just say like, hey, Try to find uh, um, an emotional connection with the workouts that you do and understand why it is that you do them. And also try to find exercises that you don't like doing and try to find a emotional response on why that is. Why do you not do these? What? How do you feel about them? And just have an introspection among yourself. Like, um, oh, I don't like uh, I don't like bench press. Why don't you like bench press? You know. Oh, I don't like uh, kettlebell swings. Why not? Like, just figure out what that is. Why do you like the things you like? Why don't you? Things you don't like. Understand what that is and just put some food for thought for next time. Cool. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in on this episode. I'm sure this is not going to be the last one of me and Josh being on this podcast, but thank you for listening in. This is the Beyond the Exercise podcast. Peace.